Hello everyone, Dr. Mad here. Let's get mad about a Christmas carol. So we are reading stave two at the moment, the first of the three spirits. So this is where we left off in the last video. So let's carry on. The spirit gazed upon him mildly. Its gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odours floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. So this bit here, so they're on the ground, remember, so the spirit has left his hand, he's no longer holding his hand, but Scrooge is still sort of feeling it. And this thing here, obviously, exaggeration, hyperbole, but odour, so means smells, and it's not an accident that Dickens chooses the sense of smell because the sense of smell is a very powerful sense, brings back memories in a way that the other senses don't do as much, strangely enough. And so basically he's thinking about his childhood, okay? Your lip is trembling, said the ghost, and what is that upon your cheek? So he's obviously maybe crying. Scrooge muttered, with an unusual catching in his voice that it was a pimple and begged the ghost to lead him, lead him where he would. So obviously he doesn't want to admit that it might be a tear, that he might be crying. You recollect the way, inquired the spirit. So recollect means to remember. Remember it, cried Scrooge with a fervour. I could walk it blindfold. So fervour means passion. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognising every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, its church and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them, with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country gigs and carts driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. So, sorry, um, yeah, so just going back here, so the ghost says, oh, well, it's strange that you, on the one hand, when you're here, you remember everything and yet at the same time you've forgotten it for so many years you've never been back he doesn't say all that but that's what he's implying and and shaggy means hairy pony hairy and a gig is like a carriage for people to sit on and it's pulled by horses a cart is something similar but with a cart you would transport other things and all the boys are very jolly and merry music. So there's alliteration there. Crisp air laughed. So obviously, what technique is that? Personification. So Dickens is portraying the little town as being very jolly and the boys are very happy to be there. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. But... This line here means that these are not real, uh, these are memories, these are Scrooge's memories, okay? The jocund travellers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at crossroads? and byways for their several homes. What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas. What good had it ever done to him? So jocund means jolly, happy, and Scrooge recognizes them. In other words, they are his boyhood friends, and he's really happy to see them. 
but he kind of denies it to himself. Why did his cold eye glisten? So a rhetorical question there. So glisten means to shine, so he's crying basically. And byways means like side roads or different ways to their various homes. So lots of rhetorical questions here. He's trying to, he's basically denying to himself the happy feelings that he's experiencing. The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. So they're going to the school that he used to go to, and that solitary means alone. That's him, that's Scrooge. And he's been left there by his friends and presumably by his family. So we're starting to get hints of his childhood and why Scrooge has ended up the way he has. Scrooge said he knew it and he sobbed. So finally he starts to cry openly. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes, for the spacious offices were little used, their walls were damp and mossy, their windows broken, and their gates decayed. Fowls clacked and stratted in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within. For entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them wholly furnished, cold and vast. There was an earthy savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight and not too much to eat. Okay, so let's just go back to this paragraph here. So they leave the main road by a small lane that he remembers and they approach a mansion, which means a big house, but in this case it's basically the school. Uh, so a weathercock is something you put on the top of a roof to tell you, and it's in the in the shape of a a chicken, a male chicken, yeah? Kapala is a dome, dome, a round shaped roof, okay? So this thing here is mounted on top of the roof, and it tells you which direction the wind is blowing, and a bell hanging in it. So it's a large house and it's been run down. Spacious means big. So the big offices were not used. The walls were damp and mossy. So obviously mossy means where moss grows and that tends to grow where it's damp. Windows were broken and the gates were run down. Fowls are chickens. They're clucking and strutting. They're walking around arrogantly, obviously that's personification. And the coach house where you store the coaches, like the carriages and so on. So it's all run run overrun with grass. Retentive means to retain. So it's saying even the, the inside also was run down, the hall was dreary, it was dull and run down, and all the rooms were poorly furnished and they're cold and huge. Earthy savour, so it means like a muddy smell and chilly. And he's kind of reminded of getting up early because that's why you would need the candlelight to wake up because it's still dark when you wake up and they didn't have much to food, much, uh, much food to eat. So obviously the, the schools in those days were not, um, were not great places to be in. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room made bearer still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire and Scrooge sat down upon a form and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. And so they go inside this room, obviously a classroom, melancholy means sad, but there's personification obviously and form here means bench so they would sit on these long benches and this lonely boy is basically Scrooge so this is all memories from childhood that the ghost is showing him feeble fire alliteration and personification and Scrooge sits down on one of the benches and cries because he remembers his childhood which is obviously not very happy 
Not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the panelling, not a drip from the half-thawed water spout in the dull yard behind, not a sigh among the leafless boughs of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not a clicking in the fire that fell upon the heart of Scrooge with a softening influence and gave a freer passage to his tears. And then as he sits there, everything that happens, every slight sound he hears, reminds him of the past and makes it easier for him to cry. So latent means hidden. So any echo or a, a squeak or shuffle from the mice or a drip from the water spout or a sigh from the trees. Despondent means sad. Popular is a type of tree. So any clicking. So all these... Dickens is just listing all the various sounds that he hears and they make they remind him of that time and he he cries more. The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self, intent upon his reading. Suddenly a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt and leading by the bridle an ass laden with wood. Now here, so they look out and they see this figure and it says wonderfully real and distinct to look at, but actually it's not real. What we're actually going to see here, what we're going to find is that he's remembering these fictional characters. So in other words, he spent his childhood reading because he was alone. He had no, nothing else to do, nobody to play with. He was neglected by his family. Dickens doesn't totally explain everything that, about this childhood, but this is the impression that we're getting. We don't know why he was left on his own, that kind of thing. Why, it's Alibaba, Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. It's dear old honest Alibaba. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time, just like that. Poor boy. And Valentine, said Scrooge, and his wild brother, Orson. There they go. And what's his name? Who was put down in his drawers asleep at the gate of Damascus? Don't you see him? And the Sultan's groom turned upside down by the genii. There he is upon his head. See, serve him right. I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? So here, hopefully you can recognize all these references to fairy stories and characters. So Alibaba. So yonder means over there. This is obviously Scrooge. So, because he was left alone, to his imagination, these characters came alive, okay? Valentine and Orson is a story of twin brothers abandoned in the woods in childhood, so obvious connotations there. And yeah, all these references are basically references to a book called The 1001 Arabian Nights, very famous book of fairy stories. If you haven't read them, you really, really need to read them. They're wonderful. To hear Scrooge expending all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying and to see his heightened and excited face would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. So obviously this is fairly straightforward, this paragraph, that if his business friends were to see him talking like this, they'd be really, really... Surprised? There's the parrot, cried Scrooge, green body and yellow tail, with a thing like a lettuce growing out of the top of his head. There he is, poor Robin Crusoe, he called him when he came home again after sailing round the island. Poor Robin Crusoe, where have you been, Robin Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday, running for his life to the little creek. Aloha, who? Halloo! And this paragraph here is a reference to a book called Robin, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe, very famous book. You, that's another one you should really read. We don't need to understand, worry too much about the details of it. So he's just talking about the various books he remembers reading. So Robin had a, Robinson Crusoe had a, a parrot and he was stranded on a desert island where he met a, a, a native that he called Friday. Then, with a rapidity of transition, very foreign to his 
usual character, he said, in pity for his former self, poor boy, and cried again. And then rapidity so means quickly and transition to change. So now he changes back to crying again. And he's not used to this. He normally stays exactly the same all the time. He prides himself on it. He doesn't show any emotion. He doesn't change emotions. But now he's kind of changing from crying to being serious and back again. I wish Scrooge muttered, putting from crying to laughing and so on. I wish Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him after drying his eyes with his cuff, but it's too late now. What is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, let us see another Christmas. So here he starts to say starts to say something. Uh, he has a sudden memory, and he's he's thinking, "Oh, I wish I'd done something," but then he says, "It's too late now." So we'll see what that was in a minute. And the spirit asks him, what, "What's the matter?" And then he says this. And do you remember the earlier on when the little boy came and tried to sing a Christmas carol through his office door, and Scrooge chased him away? So he's now regretting it and wishing that he had given him some money. So the ghost doesn't say anything and just says, okay, let's see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling and the naked legs were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that he was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that, here, that there he was alone again when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. And then, so they go back in time to another Christmas and they're still in the school and it's darker and dirtier. So lades are strips of wood on the wall or ceiling. So it's really run down, you, you, all the plaster has come off, you can see the wood inside. So Scrooge doesn't know how the ghost is doing this, but what he does know is that it's all correct. His memory is exactly the way he remembers it. And he's been abandoned again, all the other boys have gone home for the holidays, but he's been left at school. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously towards the door. So now he's not reading, he's walking up and down, probably waiting for some to be collected. So mournful means sad, so he keeps looking at the door. So yeah, so he, he's waiting to be collected. It opened and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him, addressed him as her dear, dear brother. So that's fairly straightforward. I have come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child, clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh, to bring you home, home, home. So this is puzzling. Dickens doesn't really explain why he's abandoned and now why he's suddenly being allowed home. But the important point is that clearly we can start to see, we can see where how Scrooge has become the way he's become. He, he didn't have a very happy childhood. So you can see why he's against family as well, so probably not just about the money. Home little Fan, so Fan is his sister's name. Yes, said the child, brim full of glee. Home for good and all, home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one day at night, when I was going to bed, that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home, and he said yes, you should and sent me in a coach to bring you, and you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes, and are never to come back here, but first we're to be together all the Christmas long, and have the merriest time in all the world. So, I mean, Dickens may be thinking about his own father here, so his father did have a job and he did work, 
but he, he spent a lot of money as well. He wasn't very careful. So that's maybe the image that Dickens is using to paint a picture of this father here. But anyway, so he does call him home at this point. And maybe this confusion about why the father is behaving like this might reflect Dickens' own confusion as to why his own father behaved like that. You are quite a woman, little fan, explained the boy. So it, this obviously means that he hasn't seen his sister for a while and she's obviously grown, grown up in the meantime. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head. But being too little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness towards the door, and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. So this paragraph is fairly straightforward. Embrace means to hug. Loathe means reluctant, but here's the opposite. So nothing loathe means uh, he was very willing to go with her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box there. And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condescension and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. He then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best parlour that ever was seen, with the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows were waxy with cold. Here he produced a decanter of curiously light wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered instalments of those dainties to the young people, at the same time sending out a meagre servant to offer a glass of something to the postboy, who answered that he thanked the gentleman, but if it was the same tap as he had tasted before, he had rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk being by this time tied onto the top of the chaise, the children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly, and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the hoar-frost and snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. So this is a long paragraph here, let's just go through it. Um, so this is the headmaster giving the orders that Master that Scrooge's suitcase should be brought down. And he comes down and glares at Master Scrooge with ferocious condescension. Ferocious means like wild, angry. Condescension means to look down. And this obviously scares. And then he shakes hands with Scrooge, which scares him. But all of this is Dickens being a bit humorous, okay? So the headmaster is not really angry. It's just that to Scrooge and to all children, teachers and especially the head teacher can look f scary even when they're not trying to be, even when they're not. And he then takes, the head teacher takes Scrooge and his sister into, so various means truest, old well. So to the, this is just like a simile, if you like, or a metaphor, uh, into the, fr like a front room. And there's maps on the wall. Celestial means to do with the sky and terrestrial means to do with the earth. So obviously these are uh, globes. Lines of the earth, and these might be maps of the sky or something. And but it's so cold that they're kind of they've got frost on them, they're waxy with cold. A decanter is like a jug or a container, so wine and to administer means to give installments in bits of these delicate small things, so the wine and the cake to the young people. In those days, they, they would give a tiny bit of wine to. To young people obviously nowadays that wouldn't be allowed meager means small so he sends a small servant out to offer a glass of something of wine to the postboy but the postboy says that if it's the same wine as before he doesn't want it in other words it's obviously not very good and then by this time the trunk has come and been tied on top of the carriage and the children say goodbye to the schoolmaster very happily and they drive happily off down the garden road and hoar frost is just another word for frost. Hoar means like grey, it's a grey white frost. And evergreens of trees, so trees that remain green throughout the year. 
Okay, so we'll stop there. We're about halfway through stage two. So in the next video, we will carry on with that. So it only remains to say, as always, if you found this video useful, please don't forget to subscribe and to tell all your friends about it. And see you in the next video, halfway through stage two.